Good morning, good evening, good ever afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza, and for those that have listened to the podcast for some time, you know that the first podcast or the second podcast was There Are No Accidents. And since there are no accidents, before I introduce my guest, I'd like to dedicate this podcast to my aunt. So yesterday, she had gone to a regularly scheduled doctor visit to give some blood, and she flatlined. And I also have to give a shout-out to a, the movie A Christmas Story, because when she flatlined, her mother, my grandmother, she was like, oh, here's the party. And my grandmother put her foot on her forehead and pushed her back down to the third dimension, said it wasn't her time to go. And with that, I actually have a guest today who actually had a near-death experience, too. So if you can imagine dying in this case and then coming back and your gift was to be able to see and hear people's destiny, that's my guest today. She is the CEO of Soul Priority, and she did just that. She began her journey and dedication to help entrepreneurs leverage the gift that is already in them. She uncovers what your true calling is in the world and sees the assignment on your life as well as your path to abundance. So she's worked with Olympic athletes, professional athletes, CEOs, seven, eight-plus figure businesses, and we have her here for the podcast for Intrinsic Motivation. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mariko Frederick to the podcast. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me today. Absolutely, yeah. It's like there's no accidents, as we were saying before we start recording. And my aunt had a near-death experience yesterday. It's like, I, hey, did she do that? <laughs> I can't, can't plan this. Said I, had, I had goosebumps. I said, oh, my gosh. And then you said she got pushed back down. And I said, yeah, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. that movie Christmas Story, right? Like Christmas Story when he goes and he wants the BB gun and he's like, he'll you shoot know, your eye out there. I'm so embarrassed. Okay, I haven't seen that movie. And I know it's embarrassing. <laughs> and my husband, I know. Oh my gosh, I'm embarrassed. And now the whole world knows. Um, my husband has seen it. He quotes from it all the time. And I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so after the podcast, just tell him he'll shoot his eye out. He's like, what? She's what? <laughs> <laughs> now I have to watch it. Now I have to watch Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> so life didn't begin with the NDE, even though that is a defining moment of your life. So if you can go a little bit into who was Moriko Frederick before the near-death experience happened. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Yeah. So Mariko is a Japanese name. I'm half Japanese. And I was practicing alternative medicine before, before that moment. And I was an avid rock climber. I was living in the mountains. And I was perfectly happy. And then I died. And it kind of it kind of put a wrench in things for a while. Um, <laughs> you, <think? laughs> I, you know, it's, it's like not it's not part of your life plan. Like I'm not supposed to die in the middle of my life, and <laughs> and you don't come back the same. And so, you know, it's it, it, it's such a great question. Who were you before? Because it, it really is. And I I haven't spoken to anybody else who's died. I've never read somebody else's book who's died. Um, I've really, it's such a sacred experience that I've never looked into what other people go through. But I can say that I believe that we come back so different that for myself, it, it was almost like, who was I? Who was that? You know, and, and, I, and, it, and it, it's hard to remember. How do I go back and be that person again? So there is definitely, for me anyways, a before and after version of Mariko. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask you, uh, with the Japanese origin, and you're in California, so there is a, a huge Japanese uh, contingency out there, a population. Uh, mm -hmm. Were you in touch with your Japanese roots, or was it, I mean, before your near-death experience? And do you have that as an in integral part of your life today? Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, so my mom is from Japan. Um, she was actually born in, in West L.A. She was born here, and then they sent her back to Japan during World War II when she was a little girl, and she grew up there and then came back later. Um, so, yeah, I've grown up with my aunts and uncles all around me um, in the Southern California area. And, you know, definitely the food and the culture, um, a huge part of my, my life. Um, language, not so much. I think that generation, you know, post-World War II, they were really fighting um, – 
to, to, to be seen as Americans. And so mm-hmm. my aunts and my mom all agreed and uncles, um, English only, right? So especially being half, um, it was, okay, we're, we're just, you're going to be Americanized. And so um, when I'm around, you know, Japanese culture, especially, I'm very at home. It feels like home to me. Um, I just don't necessarily speak the language. I understand a little more, um, you know, if I'm around it enough, I know it. You know, I can say a lot of um, half Asian kids, we might not know the language, but we know when they're talking about us. <laughs> <laughs> and we generally know exactly what they're saying. And they're like, how do you know? We're like, oh, we know. <laughs> Uh-huh. So, yeah, definitely connected to that side of me. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, and I finished high school in Orlando, outside Orlando. And mm-hmm. there, there was a huge Spanish population. And so you would go, or I would go to a friend's house, and grandma, if grandma lived there, you know, she would speak Spanish. But they mm-hmm. wanted her kids to learn English. And so there was a lot of Spanglish in the house. So mm-hmm. I didn't know if you mm-hmm. were going back and forth with American and Japanese. No, not so much. My, you know, so the nice version is they wanted us to be Americanized, but my sister and I, I think agree. They just kind of wanted their secret language. <laughs> my mom and her sisters. I think that's also part of the thing of being, of being Hapa, of being half Asian. We're like, I mean, I think you want a secret language too. So, mm. uh, yeah, yeah. There was, there was, um, I remember being young though. Like I remember my whole childhood. I remember my memory goes back. Um, pretty far. And I remember moments where I was learning both Japanese and English at the same time and learning the words for both. And so, um, but then, no, they ultimately decided just English only, which, you know, my mom's 88 years old. So, you know, she had me late in life. And now that would never be, you know, most parents would be like, yeah, be bilingual. But her generation, not so much, especially coming over post-World War II. Sure. And yeah. the the reason I was asking is because usually – in my experience, not my experience because I haven't had an NDE, but people I've spoken with, they have some t- I mean, it's not all the same. Like you said, everyone's an individual experience mm-hmm. for the most mm-hmm. part. But they're ha- for people of other cultures and they didn't have access to their culture beforehand, it seems like there's some ancestral connections that they pick up on. So that, oh, no I was kidding. trying to lay that framework, yeah. Oh, no, I've never heard – well, again, I've never looked into anybody else's experience. So, no, I would say instead of a cultural connection, it was really a shedding of all – everything I thought I was. It was a shedding of identity. Shedding of identity. It, what I find really funny about that is – most people are that I that have been on the podcast or just in in other lives that I that I come across people they have the traditional you know corporate life and then something happens and then they become spiritual and you were already a quote unquote granola person and now you work with businesses. So. <laughs> how, how did that work out? I never I never, I never thought of that. You're right. I, I don't know how I, that worked. I think that was exactly what I was sent back to help, though. When I came back, after my first breath, I envisioned, I, I could feel a like room full of, 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 of like corporate CEOs, like corporate CEOs and, and business people. And that was 16 and, that was and a half years ago. So I wouldn't have, you know, back then with my practice in alternative medicine, I would have never guessed that, you know, fast forward, once I was healthy enough to work, that I would be called to serve people who um, are more in the corporate setting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, I'm just trying to imagine 16 years ago, which seems like a lifetime ago, it was definitely before, I guess, the resurgence of the popularity of spirituality, because mm-hmm. what the bleak that we know was around that time, the secret was shortly after, and mm-hmm. so there was a lot of openness to it. But if this happened to you 16 years ago, what was it like dealing with corporations at that time versus today? You know, I didn't deal with them at the time. Um, After I died and came back, I really, I was sick. I was in bed. You know, I I wasn't working. Um, I could still do some intuitive work for some people at some points, but really, you know, I came back from that experience and I just continued to get sicker and sicker because what I didn't know was that I had Lyme disease and it was going to my brain. And so three and a half years, you know, after that experience was caused by a different accident, I, at that point, I couldn't walk. I couldn't speak correctly. I sounded like I'd had a stroke um, because apparently I was having little mini strokes. Um, mm-hmm. I was confused, right? So, so I went from really, you know, this avid rock climber, 
you know, somebody practicing traditional Chinese medicine, having her own practice to being unable to, you know, turn on a lamp or get dressed by herself or crawl to the bathroom. And so, you know, for me, it was, like I said, it was really a stripping away of identity in so many levels. But um, I, I wasn't working with anybody for a while. I was, I was literally, uh, I, you know, it it felt like I was just existing because the person I was before I died was kind of gone, right? I wasn't going to go back to that. And I hadn't yet become who I was meant to be, but I was in this sort of, it it felt like limbo of like, okay, but what should I do? And then also I can't, I don't have the strength to get up and walk to the bathroom on my own. So, so Mm. then what do I do? Right. So it wasn't, it wasn't presented to me so fast. It was, you know, and I, and I joke about it. I'm like, you know, it really wasn't fair because when they send you back, you're all blissful and they're like, go back and help people. And you're like, okay, actually, no, I said, no, I was smarter than that. They, they had to tell me three times to go back. But when I did, you know, I thought I was going back to help people because that was the assignment on my life. And instead I spent really over a decade unpacking, spiritually unpacking, not with words, but spiritually unpacking and experiencing everything I needed to go through in order to be the person that I can be today to help the people I'm here to help. Does that make sense? No, it makes total sense. And if I could make a parallel to 2020, a lot of people are not in your situation, but, you know, a degree away where they feel like they're in limbo of, you know, what is happening in 2020? There's so much happening, you know, every month. And then, August comes around and it's hold my beer. We have Hurricane Laura that's right around the corner. So right. it's like, I, that's where my next question is, is because how did you get through the limbo? Because I'm sure, you know, like you said, as a rock climber, what have you, you're so used to getting up and getting out and doing whatever you wanted to do. And now you don't have that capability. So what was that? How frustrating was that? And how did you, you know, get through I think- it? Yeah, it, I had my moments of just utter frustration, and I would definitely allow those. You know, I would I would break down and cry when I had to. Um, I think the other thing, the gift I have, which not everybody in 2020 has, is when you come back from death, you come back with a lot of bliss. Yeah, I came back pretty tuned in and dialed in and just blissful, um, despite, you know, pain in my body, despite, you know, no energy in my body, despite not knowing how I was going to create a life again for myself I had I had that bliss that divine bliss running through me for a long time afterwards um but you know that did it didn't fade all the way but it wasn't like as extraordinary as it was you know the first week (laughs) the first year (laughs) uh, where you're just like floating in this divine you know consciousness but it was always there but I think it was just you know people ask me that a lot like how did you heal from end-stage Lyme how did you do this And, and really I think you have to make the choice to save your own life. And so there was a moment that I realized that, you know, alternative and Western medicine was not going to necessarily save my life, save my brain, bring me back online, right? It might not work. And so I just chose, like literally it was one choice, one moment in my life where I chose to save my own life and decided I'm never going to complain again. I'm never going to say I'm sick. I'm never going to say I'm tired. I'm never going to say I can't. And I just took all of that out of my language, but also my consciousness, right? So it didn't matter that I couldn't stand up, right? If someone's like, you know, hey, can I get you anything or do you want something? I'd be like, oh, yeah, can you get, you know, because I actually can't stand up right now. But it wouldn't make a thing out of it, right? And so it was really like despite our circ- despite my circumstances, my husband, you know, was right there with me, I chose to only see the light, only see the positive and just live from there every moment. And so I think that's what so many people right now in 2020, as it's like we thought March and April were bad and now we've got hurricanes and fires, you know, mm-hmm. And, and it just continues to, to roll downhill, but it is up to the individual person to start to choose something better for themselves, to start to choose a thought that brings them into the life they want instead of the complaining that brings them more of the life they don't want. Mm-hmm. And I'd like for you to reiterate that point because it sounds like a relationship this is probably a volley to you, but what is the relationship, like you said, you took it out of your language. So what is the relationship of what you vocalize and internalize as you co-create with the universe? What is the relationship? Like how do yeah, I do it? Yeah, is there it? a relationship? Do you see that there's a relationship between what you speak out of your mouth, your, what your language is, and what you're thinking? Do you, is there a relationship or oh. 
did you, were you able to see correlations of how you hold your esteem? Yeah, I think for people, you know, it really is about tuning into your soul. And, you know, I think people think, oh, my God, that's so hard, right? We believe meditation is so hard. And it's actually not. Um, it's just a state of being, right? If you know enough about meditation, you know you can't really learn to meditate. You can learn concentration techniques, but being in a state of meditation is being in a state of awareness, a state of consciousness, right? And, and it's not necessarily, um, like sometimes you don't need a technique to get there. You could just kind of close your eyes and be there, or you do techniques to get there. So that's one way, but it's not the same way for everybody. And so most of the people I work with, you know, they might do a yoga class or meditate occasionally, but that's not their thing. Um, and so they really work from a life of service, of how can they make the world better. And when that's really the foremost on your mind and your consciousness and your heart is how am I improving the world, how am I adding value to this planet, to humanity, to the environment, it's amazing how the world, you know, the universe sort of echoes that back at you of gratitude mm -hmm. and this mm -hmm. unfolding of who you really are as the soul through work. And so I think that's why I was sent back and, and do work with so many high achievers, you know, in, in mm -hmm. the business world and not so much the yogis um, is because there is that path. There's some, you know, I've worked with some highly, highly advanced yogis who are all dressed up as business people and <laughs> you would never know and they won't even use that language right but I, I, mm -hmm. I, I have the opportunity to work with people who are very very you know on the path of enlightenment um, but they don't they don't show up in that way in the world right um, yeah. and so oh. I, I help teach them how to navigate aligning the, their soul's work with their business so that they're always serving sure I'm actually laughing because I'm thinking of a, a, a good friend of mine. Uh, we were dating at the time, and we knew each other as corporate people. And mm -hmm. one day, I think at my house or something, I brought up um, maybe Abraham Hicks or something. Or she did. I think she introduced me to Abraham. And we were like, holy crap, I see a totally different side of you. And this was 08. <laughs> so it, it, from the oh. corporate side, it's always like I don't want to show – that side of myself yeah. right and so yeah. she was that way too like i'm not like you know i mean since you see both sides when you said they're they may be yogis but you're like i'm not going to that conference they all dress they all wear beads and they right. don't wear suits right, right? there right. was like a demarcation but you i think you're actually bridging that gap also mm -hmm. i absolutely am yeah it's been um it's been an honor and i just i'm so blown away by the high conscious uh, souls that are in the corporate world that are that are that are you know uh, running seven eight figure companies that that have mm -hmm. that are the founders and entrepreneurs and their consciousness is so elevated but they don't look like it if you were you know if you didn't know them and, and you couldn't tune into their soul the way that I could um, you might just really judge and say oh well that person's an executive producer or that person's you know the CEO of that eight-figure company or whatever and you wouldn't really think past that and then you you see what they're meant to do and it's like oh my gosh no wonder the universe has you aligned with such resources you're meant mm -hmm. to play you've already played big and so the reason you know I, the reason I think they find me is they've already played big and now they're like okay how do I how do I now, now that I've hit 100% in my company, now that I've hit 100% in life, and everyone looks at me and goes, wow, I wish, I wish I had your life. I wish I was, you know, that rich or whatever people think, right? Mm -hmm. Now what they're thinking is I want to go past that. And so that's what I do is I say, okay, you've hit 100%. Now how do we help you work from the infinity of your soul to where you truly mm -hmm. are working from a limitless resource and in alignment with what you're meant to do so that when you leave this world, you've done the assignment on your life. You didn't miss it. Mm -hmm. How are you yeah. breaking the gap? Because I'm thinking, uh, and I'm a little, I'm setting a, a slight tier. And since you're in California, Pac-10 was one of the first conferences that begged out of football this year. Mm. And uh, you know, football may not happen, so that's the tier. But yeah. in the corporate room, in many cases, right? I, I just remember, even today in business meetings, you know, we may make references to. Uh, a Christmas story, but we may also make reference to like football or something, right? It, it's right, just right. natural part of the vernacular. And mm -hmm. so you're adding the, the spiritual verbiage, if you will. And how do you get that? Like to see you as an expert, obviously um, makes sense, but how do they bridge that with maybe their board of directors? Like 
to make sure that they still that they would still have faith in the CEO. You know, a lot of people honestly, I'm like their secret weapon. It, uh, they don't. People aren't always telling everybody that they work with me, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I I am a you know spiritual and business development person. That's what I do. I help bridge that gap. And, and the other thing, though, you know, especially starting uh, my my original practice in alternative medicine in 1998. You know, things have changed, and I'm sure you can attest to that, right? We've all witnessed that if we're, if we're old enough to, to have seen that change. Um, mm-hmm. You know, back then, you know, I, I, people didn't know what alternative medicine was. They thought it was very, you know, out there and woo-woo. And, and mm-hmm. it, it, I guess at the time it was, and I came from working, you know, before that in a neurotrauma intensive care unit, and I thought it was out there and woo-woo too until it worked for me. But, you know, fast mm-hmm. forward 20 years, and people want to 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 make a greater change in the world right it's not all about just making money it really is this i'm being called to usher in a new way of doing business and so that's where they find me and they mm-hmm. and 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 they realize like i am here to do something bigger and so i think for a lot of my my entrepreneurs you know they don't owe anybody else an explanation Absolutely. this is such deep personal work like what their soul is here to do they don't have mm-hmm. to explain that. It's really an unraveling and an uncovering of what's already in them and saying, this is your gift to the world. This is what you're meant to do. This is how this can look with products and launches and all that stuff. And it hits them in the soul, right? My, what we talk about our conversations. I'm not telling them something they don't already know. The way I describe mm-hmm. it is I'm telling you something that is in your soul, but you don't have the words for it. And I provide the words and the description. Mm-hmm. And then, then you go and you do with it what you want. So, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And let me ask you, because, I mean, if there are no accidents, and this will be, I promise, this will be my last football reference, but I, wanna, <laughs> my I want dad you to was play. My football fan. Oh, good. Okay. So I just want to, I want to, I want to, I want you to play Monday morning quarterback. And if there's no accidents and everything happens for a reason, do you think you would be where you are today if you didn't have that near-death experience? No. I mean, you can trace it all the way back to, you know, the household that you're born into. There's no mm-hmm. accidents. And, and I think mm-hmm. that for so long we, you know, especially growing up or, 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 you know, young adulthood, you know, we start to deal with our past, whatever that is, right? You go through this, these years of whether it's late 20s, 30s, somewhere in there, you start to deal with whatever happened right? Mm-hmm. Be it big or small, that something, most people don't go through life without anything happening, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe their parents got divorced, or maybe they were abused, or maybe they had a car accident that left them with a limp, like whatever, right? It can be really big or really small. And I think that, that a lot of times we're trying to deal with the stuff, right? We've heard that term a lot, mm-hmm. like I'm dealing with mm-hmm. my stuff, my stuff's coming up. But mm-hmm. really, it, it, sometimes, yes, you have to heal, but it's also owning your story, and saying that is my story and it was all meant to be, right? So mm-hmm. I can look at my story, but I'm not in my story anymore. I'm not in any of the, you know, sad stories of what happened to me early on. I stand mm-hmm. on my story and I speak from my story and I teach from my story, but I'm not inside of it, wounded by it. Mm-hmm. And so okay. I think you're right. There is literally no accidents. The universe does not make a mistake. And right now I think 2020, you know, it's easy to be like, seriously like did somebody take a day <laughs> off up there like I mean, come on you know and it's easy because you know people are dying and people are being killed and and there's wars going on and it you know i feel like so so many people get so angry but what i want to say is you know it's not like the universe or god divine mother however you call god you know it's, there's no one right way to say it but whatever that is for you it's not I, and I'll just, I'll just use god for easy reference it's not like god is like oh my gosh i'm so sorry i completely forgot about 2020 i mm-hmm. sorry i lost focus and oh my god i completely screwed up i'm so sorry you guys i'm going to get it together like no the universe this is supposed to be happening for our own benefit this is happening for us not to us and I think when we shift our consciousness to go, okay, all of this is happening for me, for my own elevation, for my own spiritual enlightenment, for my own, you know, well-being, then how can I use this, this year to better the world? Sure. And in better, in better the world and better, I guess, overall, that's the overall goal. 
But I, I want to ask you. I want first. I want to give a shout out to the fine folks at Valuetainment. Their YouTube channel is awesome. And today they were talking about uh, the 15 pre-election predictions. And at the end of it, they referred back to their video they made in 2018 talking about the 10 industries facing massive disruption. And it's kind of eerie to watch that video from two years ago, how much on point it's happened and how accelerated mm -hmm. it has been because of COVID. And so uh, one big thing in the news was, was – um, Warren Buffett, he has all these all this cash on hand. Like he's waiting for this downturn so he could buy things on penny on the dollar. And I was just wondering with you working with, with businesses, they're always look they always have to do the the projections. What are the five year projections, the one year short term? Um, do you work with them in that regard as well for especially this year? No, it's a lot of creating, actually. It's a lot of pivoting and creating what's next for them and what's new in their company and what they can do to help more clients. It's, it's, um, we really work from that point of view of how can you add more value to the world, not what companies can you buy up when they go under, right? That's, mm -hmm. If they're doing that, I'm not helping them with that part. I don't, we don't talk about that part. Everything I do aligns them with the work that they're meant to do, right? So like if we – if it was yoga, we'd call it a karma yogi, right? It's like, what, what is your path of action? What are you here to do? So I don't mm -hmm. really uh, get into that with them. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. And, and I was just wondering, with so much uncertainty, some people are grasping for certainty in any way they can get it. Mm -hmm. Sure, so that's sure. A lot, of, you know, a lot of my clients are really um, create, like I said, they're in creating mode. They're in, okay, mm -hmm. and a lot of them, their, their businesses are, you know, fairly stable, right? Either they're very stable right now or they're, they're doing fine or they will do fine because they've done fine for so long, right? And it's really this pivot of, okay, now I'm being called to do something bigger in the world and how can I do that? Um, it, gotcha. So maybe it is a little bit of, of that shedding of their own you know, identity of who they were and being called to work on a higher level and they're doing it. They're just doing it within wow. their company or they're starting a new company. Some of them are like really launching a whole new thing while, while oh, maintaining sure. the old. Yeah, because it is this, it's like this creation that's happening in them of saying, okay, it's time to, you know, game on. Let's do this. And they're feeling it. So, yeah, I haven't, I haven't worked with anyone who's asked me how to, you know, cash in on, on 2020. I don't think I'd have okay. <laughs> they, they Good. They've the wrong person. That, I would, I would <laughs> that, that vibration's not going not gonna to jive with me. I, they might get a little scolding from me. <laughs> Nice, and there's nothing nice. wrong with it. I know some companies need to be bought right now, right? That would save them in order to be bought. Um, right. But it's not. That's not where my. That's not where I'm uh, aligned. That's not what I'm aligned with. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And I like to do a little. Since you're in California, a little Hollywood um, stereotypes. So in the stereotypes with the Hollywood um, Hollywood movies, when they talk about like spiritual development and such, uh, people have a site, Claire, Claire audience, Claire, all the Claire's. And mm -hmm. in your case, you were, you, when you came back, you were able to see and hear people's destiny. Was it overwhelming? And did you find a way to filter it so it's not taking over your whole life? <laughs> It, yeah, that's a good point. It was overwhelming. I didn't understand what was happening. I had no idea. And, you know, in, in my bio, I say see and hear because the truth is I don't have a word for it in the human language for what really mm -hmm. happens. So mm -hmm. the only way that I can communicate what happens is to say I kind of see and hear. And sometimes I do see like a little vision, like a little movie of, oh, this is going to happen. Um, or I do hear like a little down, I call it a download. I just get this information and go, this is what you need to do. But a lot of what so, so we're familiar with the, the, uh, the body of light, right? We're familiar with what's called the astral body. Yeah. Like we've heard of the chakras and the auras and stuff like that, right? Beyond mm -hmm. that is something called the causal body. And that's something that's less familiar. Hollywood doesn't talk about it. <laughs> um, and that's a subtle body of thought and idea. And that's where I believe we manifest from, right? We have this subtle body of thought and idea and we manifest from that. And so when I hear people, it's really what I, what I, would, what I would say are thought waves. That's how I describe it. They're thought waves. If I put that in my bio, people are like, what is she talking about? But to me, it's like this wave coming at me and the wave has thought in it. And I'm able to, to, to translate that thought into human language. 
and say, this is what is inside of you. This is what's meant to be birthed through you. So is it like a cartoon where you see the thought bubble? <laughs> it's a no. cloud? It's not that so clear. It's not no, that clear. it's a feeling. Um, like I said, sometimes I do hear, you know, exactly what someone needs to do, um, you know, or, or I see the, the vision. Like I'll see it's, you know, a, a kind of, you know, the other day I was working with somebody who owns a marketing firm and it was the funniest thing. I literally saw like this bubble. I was calling it a circle and it was a whole new product line that she needed to launch in order to help more people that couldn't afford her top tier products. <laughs> And I just mm. came up with all this other stuff. And, and she said, how do you know so much about marketing? This is crazy. I said, I don't know anything about marketing. You know, I just know, I'm just listening to what's inside of you saying, These, this is what you need to launch in order to, in order to capture more people, in order to help more people launch. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, it's hard to describe, but that's, it's, it's an experience that happens with, with between my client and I. Now, it also sounds like it's something ongoing. Like well, it, the first initial uh, feeling is what how do you know about marketing so much about marketing it seems like you know after your first couple of sessions that you, you they have to check in with you like twice a year or yearly or whatever point is that is needed do you feel that there's ongoing relationships with your clients once they start working with you yeah definitely yeah i work with my clients for years actually it's not even just once or twice a year they 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 um you know now i've more formalized it from when I, when I first came back and was able to work um, to where I do have, you know, shorter term six week programs. Um, and then I have a longer term 12 months and people just kind of renew that one and, and continue on because, you know, I can touch on business. I can touch on life. I can touch on relationships. It's all of it. I see the whole picture. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they, they continue to work with me long term. I have clients that I've worked with for years. Mm -hmm. no, that's, yeah. that's awesome. And so when they, when they reach you, you, you have what's called a clarity call. So what does mm -hmm. that entail? You know, the clarity call is really seeing um, what if we're a good fit for each other. You know, nobody can, nobody can um, really make an appointment for a session with me on my website because it's, it's really a screening process for both parties. If we're okay. a good match and we're meant to work together, then we're going to work together and there's going to be magic and it's going to be so much fun. And we're going to get a lot done. And, you know, in, in 2019, every single one of my clients made more money. And it's just mm -hmm. fun to have that proof. But I also make sure that it's a good fit, that we are having, you know, that there is an alignment and, and that they have something that I can help them with, right? So I need to make sure that, that you know, they have an issue that I can actually work with. Um, so if I have somebody that calls up and they don't have a business and they don't know what to do and they, you know, they just are really lost, that might not be the best fit. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but when I have somebody that's already played, you know, pretty big and they want what's next, that's a perfect fit. So the clarity call is really seeing what they need, how I can serve them, and if I can serve them, making sure we're the right fit. Mm -hmm. And this is another, please forgive me, this will be my last Hollywood <laughs> reference case. <laughs> <laughs> we've got, we've got big old California. Football. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So in, in the Hollywood movie, I hope the season comes back for you. I hope the season, you please. know, the season comes back. I think you know here are the Padres. I think they're playing like half their season in front of cardboard cutouts of people. <laughs> I'm not kidding. My <laughs> husband works for iHeartMedia, and two of the DJs they have like like cardboard cardboard cutouts of them sitting in the stands wow. in like the first row. It's hilarious, so that the players wow. don't feel like they're playing to an empty field. So maybe you can get into baseball for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, man, I need some, I'm in the South, so we're SEC land. <laughs> we'll probably I know. do the last time. <laughs> That's a big deal. My husband was a Gators fan. Uh, oh, your husband's awesome. Your husband is such a cool guy. Go Gators. <laughs> Go, Gators. <laughs> Go Gators. That's right. He can fight with me because the football season, I always have to. I always have some run-ins with some bulldogs here in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> So, so anyway, with the with the Hollywood story, this is a scarcity question. So, in the Hollywood in the Hollywood movies, they run across somebody. Let's say they're they're hidden talent, like you would be, and then they're like, "I'm taking you all for myself," and they put you in a lair, and you know somebody has to pull, you know, <laughs> Rapunzel, let your hair down. Maybe I'm making my own movie at this point, but I'm just. <laughs> I'm wondering if some companies have come to you and said, hey, you know what, we want you on staff full-time. No, no. 
you know, I don't take up a lot of time. I, I speak, you know, even on this podcast, you can tell I, I talk pretty quick. And so in my sessions there, you know, I have one that I call the Life Clarity Intensive because we touch on, you know, all areas of your life. We do it very fast. It's only three calls over six weeks. And I record all of them for you. And in those, it's packed with information. And so because all of your calls are two hours and all of your calls are, their calls are recorded, they have a lot to unpack. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, I, I give – it. they usually leave going, wow, okay, that's, that's a lot. They don't need more from me like next, the next week, right? <laughs> They're like, give me a second mm-hmm. to digest all that. So, no, mm-hmm. no, I haven't had that. Um, no, and I'm really, I'm really for, you know, the advancement of, of businesses to usher in a higher conscious way of doing business. And so it's not just one business that I'm called to work. And so I really think even the universe sending me back to do this wouldn't, wouldn't put me in one office or one company. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. No, it makes perfect sense because I'm thinking of from a relationship standpoint also that you, you may actually marry to in the, two companies that may not have known each other otherwise because there are maybe two different industries and they didn't mm-hmm. see how they would connect. Um, oh, I do, do that all the time. Happening? It's so fun. <laughs> yes, I do. I, I introduce people I, all the time. I'll see. I'll say, oh, my gosh, you saw, I, just, I mean, last week this is happening. And I, and I, and I, and I see people from completely different, completely different fields. And I just introduce I just think I'm like, you guys are going to be and, like, and sure enough, and, and like, sure enough, I'm like, you guys are going to love each other. You make, together, first of all, I'm going to make a lot of difference in the world. Second of all, we're going to make a lot of money. We're going to go work together and go play and have fun. And sure enough, they text me back and they're like, oh my God, I love her. You know, we just had so much fun. So yeah, I see the connections that people need to make in order to advance their own work in the world and then just that universal, you know, betterment of the world. And so I do make those connections a lot. Mm-hmm. And when you when you make those connections, or I, I want to ask you of a like a typical day, I I find like if I'm in the zone that the day will fly by and I'm kind of angry that I have to go to sleep because my body needs it, and I'm just wondering how are you finding ways to bend time not only in your own personal life but bend time for clients as well. You know, just scheduling. I'm really careful to not work with too many clients. I don't take on, you know, I don't take on like a huge amount of people. And right now I'm really working on my first book, Um, you know, still continuing to launch and voice what it is I do, which will come out through the book. Um, So I'm not, I'm just not overloaded. I, I don't allow too many clients. I did that when I practiced alternative medicine years ago. That's what you did back then, right? You saw a lot of clients every week. Mm-hmm. This is totally different. I really work with, with um, you know, there's only one of me, and so I don't work with a lot of people. Gotcha. And you said this was 16 years ago, so why now for the book? Oh, you know, mm, I can answer that in so many different ways. Um, I wasn't ready is the full truth. I wasn't ready to talk about it. I wasn't ready to speak it out loud. It was such a sacred experience that I, I, I have a hard time even talking about it, um, or I did for a long time, because you know the truth is when I came back, I grieved for a year. I wasn't happy to be back. I, I didn't mm-hmm. want to come back. People ask me how long I was gone. I don't know, because I was home when it happened. Um, but I can tell you that in my First of all, there's no time, so there is no time when you leave this world. But if I had to give you a time frame, because so many people have asked me, I would say I felt like I was there for 800 years. And so for them, at the end of that, me soaring in infinite consciousness, and infinite bliss, and just realizing I am love, I am bliss, like, and getting this download from, from them, right? I felt like these beings, these, these high spiritual beings were, were literally plugging into me and downloading me with information. And after that experience, you know, what word in the human language could explain that, right? And 16 years ago, downloads, we, didn't, we, didn't, we barely had that language, you know, going on 17 years ago. We barely had that language. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I wasn't ready is the honest truth. I wasn't ready. I hadn't become strong enough in my physical body to, to be the person that can do this. I hadn't, um, I hadn't digested it myself and then it wasn't just a digesting of what the teaching is that I came back to teach it was also an integration of that into who I am 
And then also, how do I show up in the world? And then, you know, you come back and they don't give you a marketing plan and like, you know, a podcast <laughs> and a, you know, a, a funnel, right? It's just like, no, okay, didn't. you know, they're speaking, listen to you and telling you, you know, you're realizing who you are as a soul. And they're like, you have to go back and help people. And I'm like, first I said no, actually. <laughs> then they told me again. You and said, I said no, no three times, didn't you? I said no three times. Well, okay. Okay. <laughs> so here I am, my soul, infinite you know, soaring in the infinite bliss that, that we do mm-hmm. when we leave this world without any identity, not male, not female, not a rock climber, not body code, not, nothing, just pure mm-hmm. bliss consciousness. I realize that is my true identity. It's everybody's true identity. And mm-hmm. then they're like, you have to go back and help people. You have to remember who you are and go back and help people. And they're just pouring into me all of this love. But when they first said it, it was so, so shocking that my instinct was, What? Like, go back and be who? And I had, like, the idea of Mariko, if you can imagine somebody standing so far away that they were, like, you know, the size of the tip of a needle. That's Mm -hmm. how far away Mariko was from me. And I'm looking at this, because I did have this picture of myself in my mind going, I have to go back and be who? And Mm -hmm. so it wasn't an easy re-entry for me. It was very difficult. My body was very sick um, and continued to get sicker. Um, People weren't ready for what I do at the time either, and I wasn't ready for it. So, and then I had to walk through all of these lessons and challenges um, in order to, as I spoke earlier, I had to be able to go through this horrendous story of illness in order to be able to stand on my story and teach from it, right? Mm-hmm. But I think I had to go through that. And so why 16 years? I wasn't ready. Um, and then even now, I, I, I didn't want to be just sharing my near-death story because that's not, you know, you can, a lot of people have had that happen. And mm-hmm. so actually I got the opportunity a while ago and it launches next month to, to be on a different podcast where I literally, she wanted to know all the details of my story. And I said, mm-hmm. great. So I gave her as many as I could in an hour because that's not what my book is about. My book, mm-hmm. my teachings, what I'm here for is to help people align the work they're doing in the world with the, 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 the journey of their soul so that mm-hmm. their, their, their path to enlightenment isn't separate from their path to abundance and their path to serving people. And so I was like, I was so blessed. I was so happy to say, okay, let's get the story out of the way so that we can really dig in into what, what I want to teach here and what people need to, to hear. I, I want to give a shout out to my great aunt. She had transitioned in 05 and she came back to me. She came to me in 06 she said i was leaving corporate and i was like you're crazy what the hell are you talking about and it took about three years before i actually was like oh you know what what you said kind of makes sense and it was like everything was leading me to i guess who i am today and it really struck me when you said i have to go back to be who because it's my understanding that we go through that veil of forgetfulness each time so so we don't go crazy in this life. Like I was who in the previous life? And mm-hmm. I was just wondering as part of your downloads, were you seeing different versions of yourself that you brought back to help other people in your current state today? So that's two, that's, I have two answers for that. Um, one, no, I, I came back with new teachings to bring to people. And so that I'll, I'll, I'll speak about in my book about the gifts of the soul. Um, and what they are and how everybody actually does have a gift. Even people, you know, a lot of the corporate people, a lot of the successful people, you know, they think of being gifted, they think of me. They think of somebody who's a healer. They're like, well, you're gifted. I'm like, no, you have a gift too, and we talk about that. So I'll get into that um, in my book. Um, The other part is I didn't have the veil lifted or, or put down in between lifetimes. So I actually remember everything that happened in my last life and everything that we go through between dying and being reborn. And I stayed conscious throughout the entire journey. And I literally didn't know that that was not totally normal until I was 19 years old and a friend told me that that wasn't normal. I thought, like, don't, don't we all remember? Um, and so I, I did stay conscious between my lifetimes. And so that's where a lot of the stories come from, too. Um, and, in fact, I would say my biggest reason, you know, especially in business, you have to know your why, right? Mm-hmm. Why I do what I do is because when I left this world in my last life, when I died, they showed me, they meaning like, yeah, it was almost like you have this, you have your life review, but they show you what you could have been. They show you this is what life would have been like had you played full out, had you lived 100% the assignment on your life. And they showed mm. me that had I lived full out 
and really done what I was meant to do, I would have affected people, each person I worked with, um, I would have helped each person exponentially 400 times more than I did. But because mm. I wouldn't play full out, because I wouldn't listen to my intuition, because I wouldn't listen to anything but, but my own success, I, I was like, no, I'm good. I'm not messing with this, right? Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. I was so stubborn, I limited myself. And so in my life, people would look at me and say, you're very successful. But when I died, I realized that I completely missed it. I skimmed the surface of how I could have served humanity, of how, how I could have helped people. And so, you know, my why is actually from my other life or in between lifetimes that I know what it feels like and I live each day with that deep soul regret of knowing what it feels like to die with an assignment on your life unlived. And I don't mm-hmm. want anyone to feel that pain. And if I can prevent it, I'm going to do my best to reach as many people as I can to prevent that. And I want to shout out all those energies that are fighting to get into bodies because I understand it is quite a a fun (laughs) event, fun-filled event to get into this body. And so it's great that you that you have you were conscious between the lifetimes because it's my understanding you never really get it done no matter how much you have on your plate. Yeah. So you you want to come back into another iteration. You want to come back until you're fully illumined. You want to come back. Mm-hmm. And so you know, even in the other lifetimes, it's not like it's a waste. Like I spent a lot of time in the astral realm meditating, tuning in, serving, right? In the causal realm mm-hmm. when I was there, that was, that was a whole different experience. Um, so even when you leave this world and you leave this body, you're not done. You're just moving on and you're working again in a different form. You're working again toward your own enlightenment. You just have a different body of light. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, we, I think people believe, some people believe, well, some people believe you leave and that's it. Some people believe you in reincarnation. And in that, they think, okay, you're going to come back again and get it right this time. Well, guess what? Mm. All the time, right, there's no time, but, you know, if we could put time in, in, in that realm, all that mm. time in the afterlife is not wasted. You're there to be, to be growing and learning, um, you know, in, and growing in, in emotional and spiritual maturity as well as on this planet. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess that's the whole point. It, it's kind of like a, I hate to say it because I haven't gone through it, and I, I don't think I want to go through it, but you're like, <laughs> man, I lived a full life, right? And then they're like, no, you still got to go back. You're not even halfway done. And you you have that experience that you draw on. So many people I've spoken with that, you know, um, I won't share some of them because you, you haven't been out with it as much. So I don't want to <laughs> uh, just, I don't want to, I don't want to give you imprints is the best way to say it. Yeah, that's that's Um, what I've been avoiding. Yeah. So, but I want to ask you being conscious between lifetimes, because I I love um, running into people and you're like, I know you from somewhere. Is Mm -hmm. it easier for you to connect those dots like, oh, that's who you are this time, you character, even though they were totally (laughs) different in a previous lifetime? (laughs) No, I don't think I, I mean, I definitely, I think we all recognize souls that we've known, right? When we have that instant connection with someone and they feel like an old friend, it's because they probably are. Mm You know, or they may have been a family member in another life or whatever. It's, you know, you, you definitely have that familiarity with that soul. And I think that's something to listen to and pay attention to. You know, if you really feel connected and in alignment with another soul, then, you know, that's a friendship probably worth cultivating. Um, and if you don't feel that and you feel adverse, then that would be something you really want to pay attention to as well. Um, not that you can't make new friends, but just, you know, pay attention, use your intuition. Um, it's funny, though, I, I will say one of the gifts of, of staying conscious between lives is my, um, my, um, the, my take on 2020, let's put it that way, <laughs> my take on all of the, the, the anger, you know, people bullying each other, people be, getting so angry at each other. Um, when you leave this world, first of all, you realize you're, we're all one. We're mm-hmm. all connected. We're all one, right? So, but, but when you go into the astral realm and you're, you're disconnected again into soul bodies, into astral bodies, right, bodies of light, what I realized, I ran into somebody who I really didn't like in my other lifetime. Like they were an enemy. Mm-hmm. I don't know who they were, what they did, but I just, it, and it was so funny because you do, you, you have that experience of being surrounded by your friends and family um, and welcomed by them um, when you first arrive. And then I remember I remember seeing somebody who I really didn't like and it was, it was this moment of like um, gratitude. Mm-hmm. Now I'm not giving this person a hug. It wasn't like, Oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. It was like, I understand 
Okay, I'm grateful. Mm-hmm. I, I see that we were there to work something out, and I have nothing but gratitude for you. Not a lot of warm and fuzzy gratitude, but gratitude. And so mm-hmm. when we look at some of the people that we dislike on this planet right now, they are playing the role they're meant to play. And some people are playing the role of the villain. Mm-hmm. And you that's important my, to know. Yes. You, you took my next question because um, mm-hmm. that's actually where I was going to. Uh, I was thinking of the author, and I'll find it before the podcast is over. He has this um, Between Lives, and yeah. he's talking. Oh, you know what I'm talking about? A robber, is it the hypnotherapist? Um, no. Yes. Yeah, many lives, many masters. Yeah, no, I think no. that's, um, no, I, I know who you're talking about with that book. Okay. But not him. That was, not him. Okay. Okay. Not him. That's an older guy. I mean, not that this yeah. guy just free him, but No, no, but yeah. he's been around a long time. He, he wrote that book a long yes. time ago, so, yeah. Yes. So anyway, in the book, he was talking about, you know, you're meeting with your soul family and you're in the ante room before mm-hmm. you incarnate. And there's people that's like, you know, in this life, your ex-girl, or in my case, like ex-girlfriend or, you know, uh, ex-husband. Or, and you're like, I hate that person. But they're the ones that were teaching you the lesson in the third dimension. And, you, yeah. and, and they, they, they did it, like you said, they had that role and you have mm-hmm. that gratitude afterward. And afterward. it's so it's, it's it's great, yeah, right. <laughs> it's great when we're drinking mimosas talking about it, but if you're dealing with someone in your life currently, um, you're like, yeah, that, that's talk. nice, but. <laughs> it's so hard. Like, believe me, I've been, like, I've been through it so many times, and I do. I, I, have, I have had some, some run-ins, and I'm sure a lot of us have with people that are narcissistic, and you're just like, what mm-hmm. is wrong with you? And <laughs> it's, it's hard because it's like you can't, you can But for me, I can tell you that I've tried to walk away from those relationships when they're so intensely toxic. And Mm -hmm. the universe just puts one more person in my, like, oh, well, you walked away from that one. I'm going to give you the next person exactly like that last person because you didn't learn the lesson. And so I continue to to learn from from people that – that that are that way, I guess you can say, Um, you know, and I realize that the path is, is, as they say, very much through and not over or under, um, but it really is, okay, you know, what is this person teaching me? Because it, it can feel like emotionally you're getting the crap beat out of you sometimes, right, mm-hmm. by, by some of these mm-hmm. people. And yet it's happening for me, not to me. And so you really have to stop and sort of disconnect from all the emotion and say, why is this happening? What am I here to learn from this person? How is this person my greatest teacher? Right. Mm -hmm. And really listen and be humble enough to hear the answer and and willing to listen to that answer, even if it's something that you don't really want it to be. Because that's the quickest way past that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. The author's name is Robert Swartz and his book is Between Lies, Soul Regression. Oh, okay. Yeah. Talking about soul plan. Um, And when you said you have to listen and be quiet and listen, um, that takes me back, uh, not take me back because we're still in it. But in 2020, do you think that um, if you could give a percentage, which uh, I guess, no, it's not really a good question because I don't think we're talking better than. But do you think that a portion of the population is missing out on, like this is an opportunity to kind of sit and be quiet and reset and by now, everyone's seen every show and movie on on, <laughs> Amazon Prime and Netflix and all. Right. But <clears throat> the silence is very scary if you're not used to it. So how would you break – what would you say to someone that's used to having weapons of mass distraction? They always have to have something on. <laughs> you know, it's funny because you're right. It's, it's hilarious. Like, I can speak for myself. I've, I've definitely read a lot of audiobooks. <laughs> Um, and I, they're productive ones, right? I, I read ones that are that are improving myself. Um, but I think maybe one of the things that could come out of 2020 is better communication because we have seen how destructive miscommunication is. It, we've seen how easily we believe people believe whatever they see on social media. And I mm-hmm. think maybe one of the biggest lessons that we could learn if we're willing to um, especially for those of us that are old enough to remember it, is to go back before we had Internet, before we had, before, when we had to actually sit and speak to each other, when we had to call each other, 
-hmm. when we had to be front facing and say, I have this opinion, what is yours? Oh, I have a different opinion. Really tell me about that. And not mm -hmm. just argue and hate on each other over social, social, social media. And I mm -hmm. feel like, you know, if there's one opportunity that people are kind of missing is what we're doing isn't working. What mm -hmm. we're doing is creating more of what we don't want because we're getting so angry. So the more of this sort of passive aggressive anger, I don't know, the, you know, the posts, you know, <laughs> we've all seen them. The mm -hmm. more that's happening, the more we're literally manifesting more of what we don't want. But if we mm -hmm. were to sit down and speak to each other, I would say there's a good percentage of the time, even when you disagree with somebody, you might at least have mutual respect. And maybe mm -hmm. if people could start communicating directly and not just through texting and social media posts, but actually calling each other, maybe we could have a shot at, at, at deepening our respect for each other. So are you saying that the universe does not understand the word not? As much as I fight something, I'm going to have it experience. I'm going to experience it in my life. Yeah, it doesn't hear. It doesn't hear. It. It. You know. You. I could say I don't want any more. You know, angry people in my life, and all the universe is hearing is angry people in our life. Angry people in our life. <laughs> There's not any more angry people, right? So if that's where you have to tune into that higher level of consciousness. Tune into your heart. Tune into your soul, and say, okay, what do I want? What is the life I want to create? and live from there and love and, and emanate that energy, right? That emotion, whether it's love or happiness or whatever, find that and put that out there. Because the more we complain, the more human consciousness is sort of dragging down the energy of the world. You have seven, pe mm -hmm. seven billion people complaining. Where do you think mm -hmm. the energy, right? I mean, you know this. Mm -hmm. The energy is going to go where our consciousness is going. And the more we argue and hate on each other, I think the worse it's going to get. So there has to be a mutual respect and a conversation between people. We can't wait for somebody else to do it for us. We can't wait for the government to figure it out. It has to be like literally talking to your neighbor, talking to people that you might disagree with and not, you know, getting angry over the fact that they believe something different than you believe because when you leave this world, you don't believe any of it anyway. <laughs> right. And you're like, oh, that wasn't even real. I mean, it didn't really, I mean, it was real, but like, you know, that one argument you had, like, honestly doesn't matter. It's really what the universe is showing you when you leave is how did you show up in that moment? Who were you? What kind of person mm -hmm. are you? What kind of person are you and choosing the, uh, to be right now? The other way I understand it, uh, before we started recording, we were talking about first world problems and hair care. And <laughs> it, it reminds me, as you were, you were talking earlier, it made me think of, uh, I have a twin sister. So... I get I get to cheat because you know she gave me the cheat codes, and I always say it's like jazz where she can play with the music with her eyes closed, but I have to peek. And yeah. for a long time, I kept dating the same person, and mm. she or she told me I was dating the same person, and I was like, mm. no, these are five different girls, but it was the same <laughs> theme. Same mm. And so with the, when I was talking about hair care, it was a question about mirrors. And is everything that you're going through is being mirrored in your life. Yeah. So it's like, okay, if if we're having these mirrors, are you are you, is that part of your sessions too? Where now with these people, it seems like they they have there are a lot of self starters and they're seeing success. So it's not like yeah. you have to build some up from the beginning, right? Or no. you just meet people no. where they are. I meet them where they are. Most people are not. I have one program that you can kind of be in the beginning, but um, mm -hmm. no, most people I meet them where they are, um, and they've, they've, they've had some success already, for sure, yeah. I like that as a differentiator. You can kind of weed out a lot of people of, well, how do you spell near-death experience, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah but I think um, – what's that? I said I, I would – I think that's what everyone will prefer if we're very – I think the universe gives us – now, that's, that's my other question. Does it – how – when we co-create, I, I, heard, I heard two different arguments. Like, you have to be very specific of what you want, or you can't be too specific because the universe is seeing something greater for you than you can imagine. I guess that's where the yeah. clarity call comes in. Right. No, that's really um, – well, that's an easy – I mean, it's hard to do, but it's what well, can be hard to do. It really is this this – this balance of, okay, this is what I want, universe. However, I'm surrendering to a higher will for me. I'm, I'm surrendering to a higher good. So if you've got something better in mind, let's go with that. But 
with my limited viewpoint in this world as a human being, this is what I see, and then be open to suggestions. So what I always tell my clients is take what you want, hold what you want, but hold it lightly. Don't grasp it. Don't hold it so tight. It has to be this way. Well, hold it loosely, right? I have ideas of where I want to take um, sole priority as a company, and I hold it loosely because as I've noticed, right, so I had, I had a, we could talk about business and target marketing and how I thought my market was a different market that I was here to serve. But I mm-hmm. held that loose enough to where one day it hit me and I went, oh my gosh, I keep trying to go help these people over here. Meanwhile, all these other people keep trying to find me. You know what, I I think that's a great example if you can kind of go into that a little bit. I know we talked about it off off air, but if you can kind of give that a perfect, that's a perfect example of your old market versus who your target market is today. Yeah. So which part do you want me to go into? So what was it like with your, you thought it was this market and then you ultimately are serving another, uh, another market, which is actually better for your business. It's better for my business. I think it's even, I mean, I, 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 I think it serves more people, right? So if I'm serving somebody who has access to serve a lot more people, then that's ultimately serving more people, right? That exponential help that I want to provide. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. really, it's, it's taking the most obvious thing. And so even if I go back 22 years to when I was practicing alternative health, when I, my clients were a lot of these same people <laughs> mm. that they are today. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and Mm -hmm. it was just, it literally was just this moment where it dawned on me where I'm trying so hard to serve these, this certain, you know, demographic of people because I thought that's who, because they love my work. But when it really came down to, to creating a business plan and the structure of the business and how I want to help people before I leave this world, right. Because I'm accountable to my life. I'm like, okay, I need to go help as many people as I can. It's not like, it's not like wishy-washy. Like, well, I think I'm supposed to do this. Like when you die, they're pretty specific. Like, go get this done. Okay. So you know, there is no question of what I'm meant to do here. So, um, so I don't have that excuse. And so it's really just me. It was a, it was a realization of, Oh, it's the people that have always wanted my, help. Those are the people I meant to help. And I was looking the other direction to help these other people. And I think, you know, with my clients, a lot of times it really is like, well, who, or some people don't have a business yet, right? They've really achieved a lot. You know, maybe they're, maybe they're like the CFO or, uh, or whatever. And they, they're meant to do something more and they don't know what that is. And it really comes down to this conversation of, well, what, what do people always want to pick your brain about? And, mm-hmm. and a lot of times that's what they're meant to be serving through. Right, and it's something completely different than what they're doing, and that's what they're meant to do. That's what they need to build their business around, and so they do because they're like, "Oh, that I've been doing that forever. I just, you know, I don't consider myself a professional. I don't charge, whatever. It's just what people mm-hmm. want from you." And it's like, "Well, yeah, because that's what the, that's the gift your soul is is emanating from. That's that's you know, it's what you're here to do. Mm-hmm. You're doing it, and then you have this job as a CFO or whatever as well. And the best is when we can marry the two. So if I understand correctly, it sounds like I may have had a priority, but it wasn't my sole priority. But um, bum. exactly. <laughs> well, I think that you know, there's actually three priorities of the soul. And it's one of the things I want to bring back and teach in my book. But you know, the first priority is to really realize who you are as the soul. The second priority of the soul is to realize what your gifts and talents are. And again, I'm going to get really specific in my book. Um, because people believe, we have a limited belief of what a, what a gift is, right? We think a gift is just, you know, I don't know, being a healer or, or whatever, we, whatever we determine a gift is, right? Being psychic or, some, or something I do. That's mm-hmm. not true at all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just completely debunk that because I believe everybody has a gift. Now, they're not all using it wisely, but everybody does have a gift. Um, and the third priority of the soul is to take that gift and share it with the world. It's so simple. Now, doing it is more of, of integrating it and creating something around that. Um, mm-hmm. But there is that priority of what are you here to go do and go do it. And don't lose mm-hmm. track of who you are as the soul. Don't get so caught up in your ego, right? Mm-hmm. That, 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 yep. That's a trap that you can really believe you are somebody now. Look at what, look what I've done. <laughs> you know, when your ego starts to get, you know, on board with it or your ego, the, the worst is when your ego starts to get spiritual and think it's all enlightened. <laughs> ah. You're right. saying Maya's not real. Hmm? Maya's not, Maya's real. not real. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a real thing that we deal with here, right? 
but mm-hmm. but you know your ego starts to get all spiritual think it's really something and then mm-hmm. you're you're digressing just serve just continue to serve right if you're not a meditator if you're not going to sit in meditation for you know i had times in my life where i've meditated for 20 minutes i've had times where i meditate five hours a day mm-hmm. yeah, either one whatever <laughs> i have the most fun when i'm serving and i'm very much mm-hmm. somebody who can sit in stillness you know some people are very active right? That's just, that's just their archetype. They're just, they have a lot of pitta, whatever. Um, mm-hmm. I actually can sit in stillness and I can go into deep meditation and sit without moving for a long time, but I have more fun serving. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I think it's a choice. I don't think it's like you have to meditate. If your work becomes your meditation, if your work tunes you into your heart and soul, believe me, when you leave this world, you know, the universe isn't like so... How long did you meditate every day? How much money did you make? Okay, did you have a lot of followers on social media? Or like, how did you do this, yeah. right? <laughs> Not what happened. <laughs> it's really just, who are you? Were you fully in tune with the love of your soul? And if you did that through being a corporate badass, awesome. If you did that through mm-hmm. being a monk in an ashram, awesome. Mm. So that there's no chance of getting it wrong, like, you're I could gonna, be living no, a lot I mean, right now. I could I mean, be. I, I'm supposed to be a, a bulldog, but I've been a gator my whole life. Am I living a lie? <laughs> Just live true to your heart and share that love, <laughs> share that wisdom, share that light. And I don't think you can go wrong. I think you know we got to keep our egos in check and make sure that we're not, you know, getting so far into ego consciousness that we forget who we are and and who we're serving. Um, mm-hmm. but it really it's, it, it really is. You can be the guy pumping gas at a gas station and be the most enlightened person on the planet and nobody mm-hmm. will ever know you or see you. And that's beautiful. Or you could be, you know, the Dalai Lama and everybody sees you. Um, mm-hmm. or you could be like some of my corporate people, people that, that, that are not corporate, but people that are entrepreneurs that have, you know, seven, eight figure businesses and nobody would ever guess the level of consciousness they have. And the way they're working from their soul to help others, they would never know. Either way, you know, the spiritual path isn't one that, that we need to share with everyone. It's not one that we're blasting all over, right? It's right. an internal work. And then yeah. the, 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 when you're aligned, when the work you're here to do is aligned with, you know, your, the way I put it is value that you're adding to the world, that's a beautiful thing. Because mm-hmm. then you're working your whole life to add value to this world and being in line with your soul. Now, guess what? abundance starts following you around because Mm -hmm. now you're serving you're adding value to the world the universe is like thank you let's do some more of that and then all of a sudden there's more abundance right not just abundance of money but abundance of relationships abundance of happiness abundance of wealth as well health right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so then it gets then it starts to get really juicy really fun so sometimes life seems like it flies by it so fast outside of 2020 and <laughs> right, <laughs> and of that. <laughs> and it, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's perception. I mean, I, I see a lot of doors opening that, like you just said, if, if you tap in and tune in, and turned on. But for others, if if we're trying to wait for your book to come out, twenty twenty one seems like ten years from now. So how will we get in touch with Soul Priority and learning about what you're doing now before the book comes out? I know. I'm sorry. I had it, I had it scheduled for launching this year and then i think with the pandemic and everything and the election i just decided to push it to january um because it just even i need a little more time with it right like even i'm like wow there's just a lot going on and so i decided to give myself truly just a month i was going to push i was going to do december but we pushed it a little bit further um so i have you know obviously i'm i'm just spilling a lot on the podcast because i want i want to um connect with people you know, I, I know that I'm literally here to connect with certain people on this planet and I want to find them and I want to make it easy to find them. I want to make it easy for them to find me as well. And so obviously soulpriority.com um, is an easy way to find me, um, you know, my, my, my Instagram, Facebook, right? You can look up Madiko Frederick. Um, there's not a lot of Madiko Fredericks out there, <laughs> so that's easy. Um, there's actually one other woman and that's hilarious. And we found each other on Facebook and it's, she's a quarter Japanese and, it's just, it's funny because I've never seen another Madiko Frederick with the same spelling. Um, so, but really right now the podcasts that I've been on are a great way for, for people to get to know me and my work. Um, and then again, next year I'll be launching more courses and my book. Mm-hmm. Great. 
And so with that, you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza and Marika. It was a pleasure of turning our higher purpose into higher profits with sole priority. Let's well, stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for doing this work in the world. Yes, and go Gators. <laughs> go Gators. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers.